Welcome to the Truman Charities Podcast. I am Jamie Truman, your host. I interviewed Erica Komazar, best-selling author of Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. And we discussed several topics, how attachment disorders can get passed down generationally. Does it matter who the caretaker is in the first three years since your child doesn't remember those first three years of life? What affects your baby's cortisol levels? And how does that affect your child later on in life? What does it mean for you to be really present with your child? And what is the best form of care if you can't be there? And what can you do as mothers if you weren't as present as you wanted to be in the first three years of life? What roles do mothers and fathers play and are they equally important? And before a young woman chooses a career, why isn't there a conversation about how that will look once becoming a mother? And finally, can women have it all or can they have it all, just not all at once? I hope you enjoy this conversation with Erica as much as I did. Hi, Erica. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I actually learned about your work from another podcast. I know you've been on so many, um, but I believe it was a spillover I was listening to. And I yeah. heard you on there and you were talking about your book being there, why prioritizing motherhood in the first three years matters. And directly after that interview, I purchased the book and I could not put it down. It was such a fabulous book. And I feel like every young woman should read this um, before they even start thinking about motherhood. And mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the book, obviously, but before then, I want to know a little bit about your background and kind of what inspired you to write it. Mm -hmm. So I'm a social worker and a psychoanalyst, and um, I was working in a clinic in Brooklyn for four years with um, a lot of foster families, a lot of um, parents who you know, didn't have a lot of resources. And, um, and what I discovered is that the work I was doing clinically with children wasn't working, wasn't sticking, because a lot of these parents just had no basis, you know, they didn't have wonderful parenting themselves. So I started doing psychoeducational classes in the clinic, workshops for parents, and um, realized that, you know, this was the way to go that without parent guidance, these families couldn't get better. So that's how I got to be a parent guidance uh, specialist. In terms of the book, um, when I started my private practice, which was about 1992, I suppose, um, from then on, I was seeing a, a sharp decline in the mental health of children. I was seeing an increase in the number of children being diagnosed with ADHD, behavioral problems, depression, anxiety, but at very young ages, I mean, younger than we'd ever seen before clinically um, and straight through adolescence and, you know, the increase in suicides in adolescence. And I was seeing this coming like a tidal wave at me and I was thinking, gosh, what's going on? And so I started to see in my practice connecting it, connecting the dots, if you will, and seeing that the kids who were doing the least well were the kids who's, who's pres the presence of their their primary attachment figures, usually their mothers, was just not there. I mean, their mothers were busy or they were distracted or, you know, uh, or they were home and they were not there. And so I started looking at all the research, the neuroscience, the epigenetics, the attachment research that went back to the 60s, the attachment research. But, you know, they we've continued to do attachment experiments straight since the 60s. But the neuroscience research, which backed it up, mm -hmm. which said that a mother is biologically unique to children, uh, particularly in the first critical period of brain development of zero to three. And when mothers are not physically and emotionally present enough, children have stress reactions. They go into uh, hypervigilant stress kind of mode. And, um, and it's causing a lot of what we're seeing. Um, so we're sending our children into childhood, older childhood, without the foundation or the internal resources to cope with the adversity to come. And that's really, um, and there's more adversity. I mean, there's more stress than ever before for kids, um, but we're, we're really sending them off without the foundation. If you build a house without putting a foundation down, then the house is more susceptible to being blown down in a storm and that's what's happening. So that's why I wrote the book to really 
get to as many people as possible. And really, it wasn't a book about not working. Um, it was a book about prioritizing children over work. So, and so that meant that, you know, the most important thing, and the, and the analogy I always use is that particularly in the first three years, but throughout childhood, you really want your children to be the main outfit and your work to be the accessory. You don't want your work to be the main outfit and your children to be an accessory in your life. And that's really what's happened is that even though parents say their children are the most important thing, time-wise, their children have become more like an accessory in their lives. And children are suffering because of that. I do love, you said this, and I, I may misquote this a little bit, but you were being interviewed and you said, you know, your career is a marathon and not a sprint. And I really right. loved that. And so in chapter two, I really like how you start debunking myths. And one that I see that I love to touch on a little bit, and I see this a lot on social media and, and a lot of people posting about how it doesn't matter um, if you're around a lot when they're young, any caretaker will do um, because they're so little and they'll never remember. That's that is a big myth. And, you know, I'm trying to think when that myth really started. I think it was part of this whole movement to get women into the work world as early as possible after they have children. You know, even before their bodies heal, women are going back to work. You know, your body doesn't heal until about three months after birth. Um, and so women are going back to work at six weeks, you know, I mean, literally before their bodies heal. So I think it really started as a way to get women back into the workforce, the idea that babies don't matter. Also that empathic impairment where you can't, you know, I mean, I'm always, you know, I'm, obviously people know what I do. I go to a cocktail party, they come up to me and they say, you know, kind of what you're saying, babies really, they're not really doing anything. And and, you know, I, I go back to work right away because they're, they're just pooping and sleeping. And, you know, I'm going to be there when they really need me, when they're talking and can interact with me. Right. I'm like, right. no, please, <laughs> let me teach you. Let me teach you. Um, and try to explain to them that their, their presence, when that baby's synapses are firing by the millions every second, that that, that safety that they provide for that child, that security that they provide for that neurologically fragile child in those early years lays down the foundation. So when they can talk and walk and they can interact with them, you actually have a healthier child. So when did that misconception start? You could also say it's generationally transmitted attachment disorders where young women and young men mm -hmm. can actually look at their neonates they're very fragile newborns and not see the fragility not see the pain not see the suffering not see the vulnerability really and so that's passed down generationally because if you are insensitive and unempathic that is passed down to the next generation if you're sensitive and empathic and there's lots of research to show this, that it's licking what we call licking and grooming research, that the animals who are sensitive and empathic and lick and groom their young pass down to the next generation, licking and grooming behaviors. And also those young become more resilient to stress. But the, the parents who don't lick and groom, who are not sensitive and empathic, don't pass that down to the next. So we're seeing three generations of parents looking at their newborns and not seeing the vulnerability, mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy. Right, yeah, it was really interesting when you touched on that in the book. And that I also liked, which I had no idea, you were talking about the study about cortisol level, cortisol levels with babies. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? So infants in other parts of the world are worn on their mother's body, skin to skin, first on the front, then on the back. If mothers have to work, they're put on the back, but they're really held on the front until the mothers can't carry them on the front anymore um, for a full year. And why is that? Because what we know is that skin to skin contact helps to regulate stress and keeps the stress regulating part of the brain offline for the first year. It's not supposed to come online for the first year because in fact, babies are born a year too early. You know, elephants gestate for something like 22 months or something. We are meant to gestate for another nine months. 
like marsupials, think of a kangaroo. Kangaroos have babies. Those babies, if you've ever seen a baby kangaroo, they are not meant to be out in the world. They stay in that pouch for another year or whatever, however many months. We are meant to be uh, on our mother's bodies as if they're in our mother's bodies for another nine months. That's what the theory says, that neurologically mothers are serve the purpose of being the central nervous system to a baby for another nine months to a year. Okay, what does that mean? It means that um, what we're doing is we're taking babies who are not ready to be born, not ready to be in the world. And we are not only separating them from their mothers, but putting them, handing them over to strangers in group care situations. And now these babies go into stress situation, sort of their cortisol levels go through the roof and you can test it with salivary cortisol tests. And, um, and so it's turning on the amygdala or the stress regulating part of the brain much, much too early. Now, what happens when that happens is that part of the brain that's not meant to be active goes online too early and becomes too active and then um, burns out, sort of like turning on uh, the, the light in your kitchen and leaving it on until the, the bulb burns out. It burns out a part of the brain that is meant to come online incrementally after a year. And then with frustration tolerance and a little bit, bits and bits of, of frustration tolerance, it comes online after a year and builds a kind of resilience. But when it burns out, it ceases to be functional in the future. And those children what does that look like? It looks like they're, they're in constant states of impulsivity and fight or flight. They're either distractible, which is what we're, why we're seeing all these little kids with quote unquote distractibility, uh, or they're aggressive. So we're seeing lots of behavioral problems in little kids. And those two disorders can lead to things like depression and anxiety. And that and so what we see is that if you don't have that sense of security and safety from being close to your primary attachment figure in the first year to three years, you 20 years later, you still don't have it. And that's correlated with depression, anxiety, uh, attentional issues, and things like personality disorders. We see the connection between attachment disorders in the early days and later mental health issues in children. And no one wants to talk about it because it means really having to make a sea change in how we think about how we raise our children. No one wants to talk about that. They wanna talk about symptomatically, what do we do now? We have an adolescent, you know, what kind of medicate, how can we just deal with the symptoms? You know, But of course we have to deal with the mental health issues of our, of our older children and our adolescents. But what people also don't know is I wrote a second book about adolescents, which says that you have a second chance to help to regulate that part of their brain because adolescence is a second critical period of brain development from nine to 25. Um, and that period is, again, a vulnerable period where parents' presence, physical and emotional, can actually help to rewire their child's brain. So our lack of presence in our children's lives, because there's so many interesting things that are more interesting than our children, work out in the world, making money, material things, you know, social media, there's so many things that look so like candy, that we've forgotten that if we're not present for our children, our children can't be healthy, period. You know, I, I was reading and your book, and I found this very interesting, and I wish I would have known this when I had my children, was that it's better, as you were saying, to be gone for say two hours a day or work for two, three hours a day than to work one or two days for maybe eight hours. Yeah. Explain that. Because I always thought the opposite. My thought process is like, okay, I leave once and I come back once, that's better. Like, that's what you would first think. So explain like, why you think a, a little bit of time is better. So the idea is that you wanna be there when your children are in distress, particularly in the first three years. You wanna be there to soothe them when they're in distress. So one of the things mothers uniquely do for children in the, in the first three years is they regulate their emotions. So we're not born resilient and we're not born with the ability to regulate our emotions. Our emotions are 
like primary colors when we're born. Um, and if you've ever watched, observed infants, you see that they can go from being ah to being wah, you know, like so we call it paranoid, persecuted position. They can go into very persecuted states very quickly. They don't, they're not born to, with the ability to regulate emotions. And it's only because you're there to soothe them. So think about when they're born, they're born like, being on a boat in the Pacific or the Atlantic uh, with 15 foot waves and swells and your presence and your soothing them every time from moment to moment they're in distress uh, makes it more like sailing in the Caribbean. You know, it's never going to be flatline. You don't want it to be flatline in life, but you want to feel like you're sailing in the Caribbean. There's some bumps, you can handle them, but it's also pleasant, you know, and that's, that's not something children are born with. So it's every time you sue the baby in distress. So if you are gone for eight hours, mm -hmm. you've missed a lot of soothing. That makes okay. Sense. If you are gone for two hours, you've missed some soothing and babies can say, oh, right. And they're pretty forgiving. They can say, oh, right. Mommy is gone for a couple hours, but she'll be back, but they don't have a sense of the future yet. So if you are not there, you're not there. So maybe you get away with a couple times when they're in distress when you're not there. But if you are not there all day, then you've missed a whole bunch of moments of soothing them. So the shorter the period of time you're away, if you have to work, right. So you work for, you know, in the first year, you, you're away from them an hour a day and you have somebody else watching, maybe an hour and a half. The second year, maybe you can be away for two hours. Maybe the third year, you're away for three hours. You know, maybe you work nine to 12 uh, every morning or maybe when they're in school and preschool at three, that's when you're working. You know, I always say children have work. That's what Maria Montessori said. I'm not sure I quite buy into the idea of using the word work, but they do. They have play as work. When they go to school, they're working. That's when you should be working. So children do eventually go to work six hours a day to go to school when they're like, you know, four years old, five years old. They're going to school six hours a day in America. That gives you a lot of time to work. And so that's the best time to work because that's guilt-free time. Mothers don't need to feel conflicted, right? Because their children are also developing their lives and in school. But I think, you know, this idea of leaving very young children to go to full-time jobs, um, most mothers don't want to do that. 60% of mothers in America, if they have the choice, and they don't because we don't have a paid leave in America, which sucks and excuse me makes us the most in my opinion um uncivilized country in the world uh what other country in the world doesn't have paid leave right so what happened here uh how did we become the country that doesn't give a damn about children or mothers but we are we're that country um and so you know, but 60% of mothers in America is what the research shows. 66% um, in the UK would stay home with their children in the early years if they had a choice. And that's why I think that your book is so, would be so empowering for young women to read. Because if you have this in mind of that, you know, your career is a marathon and you're kind of ebb and flow and you may make different choices when say you get married and you buy that house. Maybe you don't buy the house that you must have the two income. You have to have that to sustain this lifestyle that you have. Maybe you're like, that's something that we'll do down the road because I may want to pull back and work part-time during those first few years or really, or not work at all, whatever you choose to do. And, you know, I think if you think about it ahead of time, and I was talking to my stepson's girlfriend and I was surprised at her answer. And I said, oh, what are you studying and studying in school? And she said, well, I'm going to be a physical therapist. I said, that's, that's fabulous. I was like, there's so many different ways you can work that into motherhood. So you can right. work full time, you can kind of be a contract, you could do all kinds of stuff. And she, her first response was, she's like, well, I never want to rely on a man. I'm like, well, that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. 
I'm just saying you may, you may want to pull back. And she's like, well, I don't think that I want to. And I'm like, but you don't know because you don't have a child. You, and I you think, don't know. You no. know and I think that that's not told enough that you just don't know what you don't know. And I didn't realize how attached you do become as a mother once you have that child and to be able to have that flexibility to be like, you know what? I was wrong. I'm so attached. I don't want to leave. And to be able to be flexible like that, I think that's something that, you know, young girls it, should be educated does, on. Doesn't that doesn't that say something, though, about our culture and what we've done to to these young people that we have told young women they should never depend on men? Um so here, here's the thing. You should never depend on men that aren't dependable. <laughs> but the idea that you should never depend on your partner in life when you're a team and you're raising children, um, what have we done? We've made men hostile figures. We've made, you know, I have two sons and um, it's very damaging what we've done. Uh, in, in, instead of telling young women, get educated, have a successful career, give yourself the option of taking time when you're raising children to work less and know that when you hit menopause, you get a burst of energy like you have never had in your life. And you can, do, you can move mountains when you get to middle age um, because first of all, your kids leave you. And second of all, you have more testosterone because as your estrogen goes down, your testosterone goes up. You know, men's testosterone goes down in middle age. Women's testosterone goes up. So we have this burst of energy that lasts for like 20 or 30 years. Um, and I'm a good example of that. I mean, my career was very small. I had a very small practice. I kept my toe because I had chosen a service field like physical therapy or psychotherapy. I had chosen a field that I could regulate. I wanted to be able to have a family and I wanted to regulate. So I chose a field I could control and I could have flexibility with. So when I was in my twenties, before I had children, I worked like a dog. I saw 40 hours of patients. When I had children, I stopped working for a while. And then I went back to five, then 10 hours a week. And that was it for a long time. And I had to lean on my husband, but he was dependable. I chose a dependable man who had the same value system as me. And we said, we're a team. What's going to be best for these kids is that one of us and, and the primary attachment figure was me was present for these kids when they were really little. Um, and so we were a team. So of course I depended on him, but he depended on me to raise these healthy children. We depended on each other. So this weird idea that we shouldn't depend on our partners, what have we done? What have we done to these young people? Yeah, I do. I think about that often when, when people say that, I hear it over and over, never depend on a man. I'm like, but you're your team. And he's also, I mean, I run the house, like he depends on me a lot. It's good teamwork. But you know what? I want to touch on a little bit about when you, in your book, you say, what exactly does it mean to be present? And then also chapter six, when you talk about when you can't be there. So presence is not just physical presence. So what I say in the book, and I always say is that you can be physically there and be emotionally checked out. You know, you have to be there physically and emotionally for young children because they need you. You're the center of their universe and you're the source of their safety and security in the world, okay? So we don't like to think about that, right? So we wanna believe that anybody, any caregiver will do, but it's not true. And also it's inconsistent because if you ask a mother who, who's the primary caregiver, even if she works, she'll say, it's me. And so I'm like, well, you can't have it both ways, right? So it, 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 clearly you understand on some level that that child desperately needs you, right? So there's a lot of denial about that. But presence, and you know, and that also debunks the idea of quality time. There is no such thing as quality time for children. Children need quality time, but they need quantity time too. <laughs> they need you there. Okay, if you're gonna soothe them from moment to moment when they're in distress, you need to be there and you need to be there physically. So. You can be there physically and not be there emotionally. You can't be there emotionally if you're not there physically. It just doesn't work. It's physics wise. It doesn't, doesn't work. Um, so, you know, that's, you have to be there attuned 
it doesn't mean that you're you're on top of your child um, intrusively, like uh, needing to be a part of everything your child does, but it means that you are in a flow of the day, you're interacting with them, you're doing floor time, you're playing with them, but you also have things you're doing around the house while they're playing by themselves. But but you're you're weaving in and out of their lives throughout the day. And when they need you and they're in distress or they want to play with you, you're back in sort of integrated into into their play so it's mothers get confused because they think oh my god you know is it that I have to be like intensely on top of my child no children also need time to play by themselves and you know there's there are moments when they're sleeping and playing by themselves and that's when you can do the dishes and whatever and uh maybe even look at an email in the other you know room if you have a mother's helper but it's it's the idea of being woven into their lives throughout the day and being there when they're in distress that is being presence of mind meaning be, having a presence of mind is as important as having a presence of body right when you can't be there what's the best form of care okay the best form of care when you're not present is what we call kinship bonds um People who are related to that child might be your spouse, it might be your gr your grandmother, your mother, your aunt, um, extended family, someone who you call aunt who lives next door who's going to have a similar kind of investment emotionally in that child as you do and is going to be there uh, throughout their lives and a part of their lives. Um, so kinship bonds is best, but a lot of people move away from their families now, um, and that's probably a mistake, something else we should probably train young people to understand that you think you want to be very far away from your family and it's a way to be independent and to individuate and separate. But when you have children, think about coming back to being close to family or extended family because um, they're the best form of childcare uh, when you're not present is, is, is family. Um, and extended family. So if you can't, if you don't have that situation, then the next best is a single surrogate uh, alternative attachment figure, like a babysitter or a nanny, but someone who is um, consistent, dependable, sensitive, and empathic, and is going to be in their lives for a very long time. So I say, if you're going to get a babysitter, make sure they stay with you for 18 years. And I'm sort of joking because you can't always keep a babysitter for 18 years, but you try. You find someone who you can have for multiple years, many, many, many years. And if you can't keep them forever while well, you need a babysitter. Um, so that would be the next best because that child then feels at least in the presence of someone who they trust and feels safe around. Um, if you can't afford a nanny or a babysitter, share a nanny or babysitter with another, with a friend. Uh, or a cousin, uh, or your next door neighbor who you trust. And that's going to be better for that child because it's going to be consistent, home-based, um, and it's going to reduce the ratio of caregiver to child. What I never recommend is daycare. It's the least good option. It's very stressful for children. It's, it's connected to early signs of behavioral problems and aggressive behavior in children. It's, it's connected to early signs of anxiety in children. You're basically, when you take a, a, a baby who's under three and you hand them to a bunch of strangers in a group care situation with a ratio of no less than probably five to one and usually more like eight to one in America um, because caregivers are often absent. So then you end up with eight to one and in Sweden it can go up as high as 12 to one. Um, you are basically stressing your child out. You're going to create a stress disorder like ADHD, anxiety, depression um, in that child. And if you ask any kindergarten or first grade teacher, and I've done this, uh, can you tell which children have been in daycare? They say 100% of the time, every time I can tell which children have been in daycare. And why is that? What are some of the signs? They are the children with higher levels of uh, ADHD, like behavior, aggression, mm -hmm. biting, hitting, um, inability to focus. Yeah. And I do like how you touch on single single moms because that is, you know, it's very prevalent. And I always say they have the hardest job of trying to be two people. 
And you give them options too of creating like a co-parenting situation with a living caregiver or a family member. Um, yes, I do. I do love how you touch on that. And then I, I really liked how you talked about the difference, how mothers act with their children opposed to fathers and the differences between the two of them. Can you talk a little bit about that? So mothers and fathers are equally important to children, but they serve different functions. So this whole idea that we're gender neutral and the same, um, we're not. I mean, uh, there's a new book coming out about father's brains, um, about how, um, you know, fathers also go through a transformative experience in their brains with nurturing, but it's not the same kind of response, meaning we have different uh, hormones that we have in to great degrees in men and women. Uh, women produce a ton of oxytocin, which makes them sensitive empathic nurturers that are very attuned to children's distress. It's the way our brains work. Fathers produce some oxytocin when they nurture, but um, and we are seeing fathers as being more sensitive and empathic. But generally, it makes fathers more oxytocin in a father's brain comes from a different part of the brain and also makes them more, um, more playful tactile stimulators rather than sensitive empathic nurturers. So that means that they're more uh, interested in playing with children. Fathers are the objects of play. Mothers are the objects of soothing and distress, right? So I have a lot of mothers that say, it's so hard for me to play with my child. I'm like, get the father, because <laughs> the fathers are really good at play. Playful tactile stimulation is produced by oxytocin in fathers' brains. Also, fathers produce a lot of vasopressin, which is um, a protective aggressive hormone. Again, it's in mothers as well. Um, if, you, if somebody goes to attack your child, you're going to defend your child, right? It's, it comes from a part of the brain. It's, 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 it's called vasopressin. But fathers produce more of it than mothers. And vasopressin, because it's tied to testosterone. And vasopressin is, um, there was research done in the UK where mothers and fathers uh, slept. And when the baby cried, a distress cry, mothers woke up immediately, like immediately. Father slept through the distress cry. But when the there was rustling of leaves outside the window, mother slept through that, but fathers woke up immediately because fathers are very attuned to predatorial threat because when they're nurturing their young, it's about protecting, protecting, protecting. And so it's just, it's a different, it, it's, they're both important. So mothers and fathers are of equal importance at different phases of development. In the first year, and really in the first three years, that sensitive empathic nurturing is critical to laying down the foundation for emotional regulation for the future for children. But fathers serve a purpose of helping children to learn through play how to start to separate, right? How to take risks, how to explore the world, um, how to become little bits of incrementally more resilient. So they, they serve different roles. So I think this idea that we're all just the same, we're not the same biologically, and we respond to our, our nurturing hormones with different behaviors. So the fact that fathers are showing more signs of uh, nurturing and being sensitive and empathic is wonderful. Um, what we don't understand and we're trying to understand now is how that impacts testosterone. So when father's oxytocin levels go up, their testosterone levels go down. Yeah, I was reading that in your book. I found that fascinating. Yeah. So, that. but think, think of it this way. When mothers have a baby, they don't have, you know, you, you always hear this from young mothers. Like, I don't want to have sex. I just had a baby. I'm tired. I'm like, it's not the fatigue. If you're in college and you've been up all night, you're still wanting sex. It's not that. It's it's not the fatigue. It, I know it feels like it. It's that nature made it so that when you are invested in nurturing, you're not invested in mating. And it did it intentionally, evolutionarily, to keep you from burning out. If you were interested in mating while you were still nurturing, then you would be having babies and babies, you develop maternal depletion syndrome, you die, right? And so, and you wouldn't be able to, your babies would die. So if you were a lioness, your new cubs would die if you mated again. 
So you shoo that male lion away and you keep him away from your cubs because that male lion will kill your cubs in nature to mate with you. So you keep that, you know, there's the, there's the vasopressin. You keep that male lion away and you're more invested in nurturing than mating, right? Yeah. And so that's a natural phenomenon. So when fathers are nurturing and stay home as full-time attachment figures, they're not as horny. I mean, I hate to, I don't know if I can say that on your podcast, but that's, that's, that's the thing. They're going to, they're going to be less interested in sex with you. So, you know, that's a deal you make. And then the mothers will come home and they're full of, and again, this is all stuff we're still understanding when mothers leave their young and go out to work and work in an aggressive, competitive environment, their testosterone goes up, but their nurturing hormones go down. The more time you spend with your baby the more nurturing you are because oxytocin is related to contact. We, we, we produce it in, in high doses when we are, when we give birth, when we breastfeed and when we are around our young skin to skin contact, not only turns on the oxytocin in the baby's brain, which is important and protective against stress. It turns on the oxytocin in the mother's brain. Actually what it turns on is the receptor. So, so we need, a receptor to catch the oxytocin, like think of a pitcher and a, and a catcher in baseball. So it, it just, the whole, it's a virtuous cycle of being with your baby. It produces more oxytocin and lights up oxytocin receptors. Now, if you spend less time with your baby, you become less interested in your baby because you don't have the same um, investment biologically in that child. And that's what's happening. So mothers are leaving, fathers are staying home, mother's testosterone's going up and they're coming home and the fathers don't wanna have sex. I mean, this is the cycle that's happening. We've tried to change a whole evolutionary cycle in 75 years or 50 years. And there's consequences. And we're going to have to address, I have a colleague, uh, Suzanne Banker, she, she writes books about the consequences. Um, you might want to have her on. She's very interesting. But there are consequences, and we have to at least acknowledge them. Maybe, maybe we can change up some of the things. Maybe women do go out to work full time, and fathers do nurture. But at least we have to acknowledge what's happening. That there are biological and emotional consequences of trying to switch up mm -hmm. evolution in such a short period of time. Yes, I right. do know of her and I listen to her podcast. Sometimes I've read one of her books. So I want to finish out kind of with your part three, which is changing the conversation. What would be kind of your takeaway that you would want people to get from this book? From being there, mm -hmm. that, um, that your physical and emotional presence in the two critical periods of brain development, but from being there zero to three. Uh, lay down the foundation for your child's mental health and personality development and stability in the future. And if you want to have mentally healthy children, you have to put in the time and you have to be willing to um, think of life as a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you don't need to get to the finish line now. You might even take some uh, side routes to get there. You might take you might sit down and take a break. You might uh, find that that by not having a linear career, you have a more interesting life and maybe even a more interesting career. So to move away from the linear and think of life as an adventure and an adventure where you need to listen to your instincts. And if your instincts are telling you to not leave your baby, then you shouldn't leave your baby contrary to society's messaging that says, leave your baby. If you don't, you're going to lose your spot in your career and you're never going to. Don't listen to those naysayers, to those doomsayers, because it's just untrue. I mean, I'm a good example. My career really didn't start in earnest in the way that it is now until I was in my 50s. And now, as you say, I you know, I'm on millions of podcasts. I, I'm on television. I write books. I, you want to have a successful career, have it. Have it in your 20s. Be a lioness. 
And then give yourself the option of being with your children, work part-time or don't work at all. And then know that um, life is long and you will have many opportunities to be a lioness again. So it's so great that you say that because, um, you know, I have two boys, seven and three. And as a three-year-old's getting older, I'm like, gosh, this went by so fast. It is just, it is such a short period of time. It's a flash. It. it really is a flash. And when you, when you say, you know, you never really know how your career is going to end up. You know, I had a, a business and then I dissolved that once I had my son and it's, and now I have like, I never would have thought I had a podcast and I'm running our charity organization. Like it just it kind of evolves into something wonderful, you know, that you never knew was going to be possible. And looking at you, look at how successful you are and what you've been able to accomplish. And you still were very successful before you had kids. And then you kind of peeled back and now look at you. So there's plenty of time to kind of, as you say, sprint um, in your career. So when I do the courage, the courage is not in, in forging through the courage is in the courage to stop and take a break and to slow down. That takes courage for women today. And I would say that's where the real courage is. The one statement that you have in the book that I, I really loved when I read it and I said, gosh, this is so true. And I think every young woman should know this. And you say, you can do many things, but you cannot do them all well at the same time. That's right. Which is That's so right. True. You can accomplish yeah. and be successful in all areas, but just not all at once. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, everyone listening in the show notes, I will have exactly where you, where you can find Erica. And then also, of course, where you can purchase being there. Why prioritizing motherhood in the first three years matters. I've already purchased my book. I love it. I swear every young girl should, should read this book. And, you know, before I let you go, is there anything we haven't covered that you would like anyone to know? I mean, I think you've covered a lot. You asked wonderful questions. So, um, and if anybody has other questions, they can reach out to me on my website. Yes. And then I'll also put in your Instagram as well so they can yeah. follow you. And, but so usually I'm either talking to founders of nonprofits and then thought leaders that, that are doing so much for the community and you are one of our thought leaders. And so I always have people um, pick a charity that resonates with them. And I'm kind of interested. I want to know why you're so connected with the Wilderness Foundation Africa towards rhino conservation. So interestingly, the Wilderness Foundation Africa does not only animal conservation, it also addresses people. Um, it, it, it really brings the poorest in Africa into the fold, um, into the tourist industry, but also it, it helps um, nature while helping also the, the villagers. And so it, it, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, also, one of my children uh, is going to be a wildlife veterinarian and works uh, in Africa often to uh, works for that organization. So it, it means a lot to me. And it's an extraordinary organization in South Africa. It's doing extraordinary work, as I say, not only with a wildlife, but also with the community, because you can't really address uh, what's happening in nature if you don't address what's happening with people. So um, yeah, th that's my reasoning. Oh my gosh, you must be so proud. One last thing as I'm as I'm thinking, uh, talk, just mention a little bit about your second book and what it's called. So I actually just purchased it last night, so I'm gonna get it in the next couple of days, but this is something great for um, mothers who said, oh gosh, like I, I, I didn't spend as much time as I wanted to when my kids were little, I didn't know. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so this is a wonderful book for them. So Chicken Little, The Sky Isn't Falling, Raising Resilient Adolescents in the New Age of Anxiety. It's a long name, and it really, the original name, you know, the publishers rename the books. Um, the first book being there, the original working title was The Lost Instinct. Um, and the second book, the working title was Second Chances. And that says it all, that adolescence gives you a second chance if you miss the first chance of zero to three, it gives you a second chance to help your children to learn emotional regulation and resilience to stress, to send them out into the world as adults uh, full rather than empty. Love that. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for coming on. I know how busy you are. 
And we'll make sure to have all the information on how to follow you and how to purchase your books in the show notes. Um, So thank you again. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of the Truman Charities podcast. Until next time. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Erica. I loved it. And I absolutely loved her book. So please pick that up on Amazon or any online bookstore. And if you liked this episode, please make sure to rate and review it anywhere that you listen to your podcast. I do read each and every review. They really do count. And while you're at it, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. If you'd like to follow us, you can follow us on Facebook at Truman Charities, Instagram, Jamie underscore Truman Charities, and you can follow me on LinkedIn at Jamie Truman. If you want to learn about our upcoming events, please go on to trumancharities.com and subscribe to our newsletter. I wrote the book, Vanishing Fathers, The Ripple Effect on Tomorrow's Generation. You can find that book on Amazon or any online bookstore. And remember that 100% of the proceeds from that book go directly to charity. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time. If you liked this episode, please make sure to rate and review our podcast. That is how more people learn about the Truman Charities podcast and our organization. And to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. If you'd like to follow Truman Charities, you can follow us on Facebook at Truman Charities, Instagram at Jamie underscore Truman Charities, and check out our website, trumancharities.com.